So thanks, Maria Jose, and hello, everybody. See, my presentation's already started before I have. One moment. Let's take that back to the start. OK, uh, first of all, I'd just like to also uh, thank Maria Jose and um, her team with uh, Creative Digital City, and, uh, and also my audience here. I guess you're mostly from Guadalajara and Mexico. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I feel honored to spend some time in your beautiful city and beautiful country. Uh, today, this is the topic of uh, my talk. I, I noticed on one of the, um, the Facebook posts, and I hit the, the translation button, and it said I was going to introduce the future of education. Well, I'd, I'd love to tell you everything about the future of education, but I'm more talking about new models for education. And um, while I can't give you the full, the full detail on what that's going to be, I hope that my talk today can at least bring some inspiration into what some of those uh, models for education in the future might look like. And uh, as you'll see very, very early on in my presentation, I think I can at least give you um, some new perspectives about how important art will be in the, in the context of future education. Just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm a, primarily a, 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 an artist first. I've been um, playing around with experimental media since, well really since, since 2000. Uh, I studied in various fields across uh, sociology, politics, linguistics. Um, I had formal training in, in media and technology. I've worked uh, in the filmmaking industry. I've worked in television. Um, but more than anything, I've just been collaborating with all kinds of different artists and media for a long time. I don't really like to use the term and introduce myself primarily only as an artist because everything I've ever done has been working with people. Um, and here's just a few samples of the many and uh, the variety of projects that I work with. In 2008, I started working with the Ars Electronica, and uh, this was quite a, a pinnacle moment in my career because I went from kind of trying to scrape together whatever I could to, to make my projects to finally being actually paid some, some decent budgets to be able to make them and work with really highly professional people. Um, and uh, here's just, a, uh, again, some small samples from the many types of projects that the, the Ars Electronica Future Lab works works on and also some of the partners that we work with. So I think one of the most important things about the Ars Electronica Future Lab is also it's, it's firstly it's an arts organization, it's an arts research lab. And as you can see, we work with some of the biggest uh, international companies in the world. So these are companies, these are industries that are investing quite serious money into arts practice for the purposes of innovation. Um, and again, just, just a few examples of projects, but I'll talk a bit more about those as the, as the presentation goes on. And uh, finally, the, the other hat that I wear, um, I think Maria Jose mentioned in my introduction that I, I represent Ars Electronica's activities in Australia as well. I do many projects in Australia. I work with a lot of universities. But I'm also um, almost finished a PhD, which I'm doing with a, with a university in Australia as well, but it's all about my work, uh, primarily in Austria, and it uses my projects as case studies to understand concepts relating to collaboration in experimental art. And as you will see up the top here, I use this term experimental art, but more broadly, my research is uh, covering many different topics which are interesting for people, whether they're working in art science research, whether they're working in, in some sort of transdisciplinary space, or at least they're interested to work in a transdisciplinary space, or whether more broadly they're, they're interested in working with innovation. So as my presentation goes on, I will refer back to this model and what, what I've been trying to do, because I think two things, really. The first is this term collaboration is is quite um, misinterpreted and it's often used out of context. I think there's a lot of people that use this term collaboration within the context of, of transdisciplinary research or the arts or particularly in, in academia without really understanding what that means. And often it's more appropriate to use terms like cooperation or coordination and what really means true collaboration. And that's, that's essentially what I think places like the Ars Electronica Future Lab represent, and I think that that's where 
new examples or new models are going to present themselves in the future to bring about very interesting ideas for also everything to do with innovation science, but also I think the social uh, impact of those sciences and technology in the future. So that was just a, a short preview to the Ars Electronica Festival 2017 and the topic for this year's festival was artificial intelligence or you may have seen the subtitle there, the under ik, which is uh, actually was a very interesting subtitle to use because uh, the under ik in, in German uh, has been used in a number of contexts, it means the other eye, but it was also the term that um, psychologists, particularly Freud, used for this idea of the alter ego, ego. So in this year's festival, they were looking at this kind of intersection between how that kind of these technologies are affecting, but with this topic really, again, crucially trying to understand it from the human and the social perspective. Just a quick and short timeline, so that was this year's festival. And that's actually what started the whole Ars Electronica. It was a festival that started in 1979, and from the beginning it's been focused on this nexus between the art, the technology, and the society. Um, every year there is a, a, a new, fresh topic, and those topics are, are really trying to address either something which is seen as being the most current, kind of critically important, um, effect of what's happening in the in the context of the society with the technology or it might be also a topic that's kind of used as seen as a um, an indicator for what is actually coming or what's changing uh, I think as electronica festival 1986 was uh, 10 indications of emerging commuter computer culture and that's that was when still some of the first OS platforms and sort of pre personal computing um, was happening 94, I think, it was uh, virtual reality. So this is almost two decades later, we're seeing the rollout of, of commercial uh, VR um, technologies, but this is kind of going back in the time, and there's many people that are associated with the, with the, with the history of Ars Electronica that were pioneers in the field, the kind of Marvin Minsky's, Joey Itu, who's the, the, the current director of MIT Media Lab, um, Roy Ascot, one of the pioneers of, of network-based um, art, um, just, to, just to name a few. Um, so this is the first point that I would made, make, just to see that, that small snippet from the festival. I think you can see the context of where the Ars Electronica has been coming really from you know, over the last four decades. The importance of this space and this intersection between these, these three pillars. Um, what I want to focus on a little bit more uh, now though, just to give a better indication of how Ars Electronica 
presents itself and understands the context of art will be the Ars Electronica in the centre and the Ars Electronica Future Lab. So this uh, started almost 20 years after the festival. And what was also crucially important about that development was that it went from being a kind of a, a niche sort of um, event that was happening once a year to some of the elite people that were practicing in what was then a very obscure, still kind of under-recognized, um, at least in terms of the art, the forms, and in terms of the technology, just way outside the, the sphere of what was happening in, in other um, more kind of uh, contemporary developments with the, with the industry. When the center opened, it's, it that's, it's basically was a museum, and it's still a museum today, it's engaging with the public on a daily basis. So it's opened, well, pretty much every day. It's closed on, on, on Mondays um, for, um, uh, for housekeeping, but otherwise it's, it's functioning all year round and it's engaging with the, with the society on a daily basis. And uh, also just to, to also congratulate CCD, they, they had their UNESCO Media Art um, uh, title granted uh, this week, actually, I believe. And they also now join with um, the Ars Electronica as part of a collective. So we're very much looking forward to starting new programs uh, that can build on that, that partnership that's been established through that program. OK, that's really, really bright. I think I have to take my jacket off. I apologize. The, the contrast on the, um, on the LED is, is a bit brighter. So this is uh, one. Of, this is kind of the centerpiece of the of the Ars Electronica Center. It's called the the Deep Space. It's a a very large, high resolution, um, immersive environment. And this this statement uh, this is not a statement that I'm that I'm putting out here now. It's not actually even from me. It's from I think Horst, the director of the Future Lab. But it's certainly one of the ways that Ars Electronica positions the value of art and how we're kind of using this as a tool to create experiences that people can, can engage and access some of these big topics to do with the, with the science and technology. The center is full of labs. We, we started some of the first labs that are, that are popular now in, in many, many ways. I think there's you know, labs popping up in libraries all over the world. I heard about a sushi lab in a, in a, in a, um, in a mall in um, Osaka not so long ago. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of this kind of movement towards the idea of coming into new spaces to engage and have experiments within the culture of the, of the, of the community. And, uh, and this was really at one of the kind of forefronts of the new programs of the new Ars Electronica Center. So we have bioengineering labs, fabrication labs, sound labs, labs to do with city and technology. Robotics labs, labs. and then and we then have, we have these pop-up pop labs. labs. Um, this um, project, this project here, ABC, ABC Meta Project, project was a fantastic, fantastic project from a few years, years, years ago. ago. It was a lead up to an event that, that happened, that happened uh, nine, nine, months nine months after, after the labs, labs were developed, and basically the, the citizens of Linz were, in, were invited to come and build a letter. And by the time the event happened, there were 5,000 letters, and then these letters were, were joined part of a big open river event where they, the last part of building the letter you might see here on the picture on the far uh, left corner is a, um, uh, a, a LED light and a, a, it's a small circuit board that you, you put inside the, the letter which was controlled through an FM radio uh, transmission to illuminate those letters. Um, and here you can see down the bottom I just make a reference to this idea of the, the city as the lab because I think that's another thing that is very close to the activities of what Ars Electronica is doing. So there's, of course, there's an existing architecture, but these, this idea of the lab is moving out into the, into the context of the society. It's moving out into the streets. And here you can see you know, a classic picture of white, middle-class, European um, <coughs> people walking through the streets of Linz. But that's, that's pr predominantly, that's the, that's the first main audience that Ars Electronica in Linz is engaging with. Um, so, just to say briefly on that topic, as we, we now have discussions with, with CCD to support and potentially partner on some projects that are happening here, and we work with many different cities and uh, countries all over the world, this is, I think, a very important point. The Ars Electronica understands this intersection between art and technology, I think, very well. It's been doing it for a long time, and although it's experimental, I think that it has um, 
a portfolio that, that represents whatever success might mean in that space, but how you engage with your culture is, is, an, is another matter, and that's something that I think, uh, in terms of what's happening here in, in, in Guadalajara, in Mexico, it's important to, to understand and realize that also. Uh, I'll just briefly lead into the Future Lab, firstly by saying this kind of circle that's represented here is something which is very unique about the Ars Electronica Future Lab. It's grown out of a cultural institution and, and that lab extends into the, into the center itself. That's, that's the place where we build our, our kind of experiments and our prototypes and when we're able to engage with the, with the audience in that, in that manner. And then as I said, that also then extends out into the, into the city. Here's an example, that's the Deep Space, that's a project with Siemens. Uh, we're using technology developed by Siemens in some, some of their photo imagery um, technologies. It's also partnered with a local hospital in Linz. And that's, again, as I mentioned, this environment is 16 by 9 meter wall and floor at 8K resolution. So it's extremely high resolution. It's also in 3D. And uh, what you can basically do is you can have people with their consent, of course, allow their bodies that are being scanned in the hospital um, you know, three, four kilometers away to be sent directly into the, into the deep space. And then you can have a team of highly trained researchers being able to engage and explore this person's body in a, in a way that they were never before able to do and never capable to do. On the one hand, and then a few days later, you have an audience coming in to understand some of the, the highest levels of technology to do with medical science, just on a, in a, in a kind of first, uh, first level experience. So again, just to underline this first point, art that creates the experience. I purposefully chose not to be too academic in my talk today, I just wanted to plug some references here just in case there, there, are, there is anybody in the audience, I'll, I can make this available through CCD later, but these are, these are some references to do with, um, with where I come from, from the methods that I use and how to qualify some of the information that I'm talking about. So now I want to discuss, I think probably for me more importantly, this idea of the art for exploration. And um, it was a pleasure to, to speak after Nahum, thanks for the talk. I mean, I love your work, I love your projects. And in terms of someone local who's doing interesting stuff, I mean, I don't think you get much better examples than you know, astronauts and artists coming together with pinata engineers and you know, it's, it, that was, they're really impressive projects and very nice in this way you bring the culture in. But that's what it's about. That's what we do in the Future Lab. We, we come from all kinds of backgrounds. We come together, we collaborate, we come up with questions and then we explore those questions. And this is one of the projects which is very well known. I think some of you may already have seen this project. It went from a crazy experiment that was a research topic. The spaxel is, is the, the term that we've coined, which is uh, a pixel in space. It's about new paradigms for display systems. And it essentially came from that one simple question of how can we get a pixel in space and how can we control that? And, and from that, we started to explore various types of technologies, drone technologies, and and uh, as you can see here from an from a, from experiment with the River Festival in Linz in 2012, it very quickly was picked up by, the, by industry and commercial <coughs> partners. Um, by 2016, we were in a very big uh, cooperation with Intel, and Intel has since gone off and set up their own company now called the Shooting Star, which is just, it's, it's massive. They were flying the American flag with 300 drones behind Lady Gaga. They're doing kind of shows all over the world. I mean, that's, that's, that's their approach and that's, that's fine. Whereas the Future Lab, we're still very much focused on exploring the research of what, those, what this new paradigm display system can do and what, what we can achieve with that. Um, never, nevertheless, you know, these, these commercial projects, that's what gives us the resource, the, the capital that we need to continue to do our work. So that's, I think, just very important to, to mention. Uh, and again, just in terms of the research, uh, Stephen Wilson, he's, um, it's, it's kind of a, I guess, a, 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 an older reference, but I think still very relevant today. Um, unfortunately, Stephen uh, died not too long after this book was written, so I think there's still some very unique and special things he did 
uh, that he wrote about in this book and in terms of that idea of you know the art for exploration or the various ways that we we understand art art from the kind of aesthetic purposes alone from art which we use to kind of understand and explore things so before that first slide when I said science creates knowledge art creates experience actually further than that and which is quite well known in the field of hoimenetics is this idea of Art creates knowledge through understanding, and science creates knowledge through explaining. And these are the kind of uh, intersections and, and kind of uh, theoretical topics I like to explore in, in my own research and to give, it, to give it qualification. Nevertheless, for me, it's based around what's actually happening on a practical level. This is the Future Lab. That's the, the director, Horst Hortner. Um, that's a quote I took from a conversation we had, and this is like... A, a great example of what's happening in the future lab where people are trying to theoretically explain this term transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity and they're kind of looking at you know these disciplines are coming together with these disciplines and it's it's happening in this way like artists come together and scientists and this is the classic model in a place like the future lab it's not like that at all and this was just one kind of thing that that popped out of horse mouth one time that I ran with and I think this is a good kind of analogy as a starting point to to use. Um, also, for those who are familiar with this STEM, STEAM kind of uh, discussion that's been going on for years, it's, it's extremely convoluted. I don't see that it applies so much in the, in the context of the work that we're doing at the Future Lab. And just based on that kind of uh, metaphorical example I just spoke about, it seems to be a bit more like that. I think that there's a kind of a, a big shift in the more in the philosophical framework that's laying underneath how we uh, how are we acquiring knowledge, is in, knowledge in the first place? And that's more what's happening, actually. And that, incidentally, is something that's very different to what's happening in most of the universities that are also proclaiming to be transdisciplinary at the moment. The creative industry model, it's a, it's a, it's a classic model that's being replicated all over the world, but for me, it represents also another way to compartmentalize something. You know, we put all the stuff that relates to creativity in this kind of compartment over here, and then we'll put the other stuff over here, and sometimes they'll kind of connect and work together. But it's, it's very different when you find it in spaces where there's a whole blend of kind of people and disciplines coming together and working in, in, uh, in a variety of ways without a, a given method that is normally associated within most of the the, um, the set disciplines or the way that it's currently constructed in, in most of the academic institutions around the world. Um, just to, uh, to qualify some of those slides a bit further as well, this distinction between art thinking and design thinking is, is very important about how we communicate what we do at the Ars Electronica in the Future Lab. As I mentioned before, we're an art lab, we're not a design lab. So when people come to us like we're a design lab and say, hey, we've got this problem, we need this solution. Sometimes, depending on how much we're struggling, struggling financially, we might have to do that, but it's not normally the way we like to work. What we like to do is to work with an industry partner to come up with the question in the first place. And I think this is a very key and important distinction between the idea of how design works and how, how art works. I'll just go back to this slide just to say, this is something you could say represents like something like a future lab. So I don't discount that design thinking comes into the kind of work we do, it's very much there and it's there from a certain point. But before we get to that point, we're going through other processes and, and other phases. And if you remember the slide I showed before from the Spaxels, this comes actually from a, a quote from uh, John Maeda, art asks questions and innovation is the ability to respond to those questions. So solutions-based approach, which is of course incredibly important, but before that, what are the questions we actually need to ask and what are the, what are the really kind of fundamental questions that are going to be most critical and important for our futures? Back to this slide for a moment. Down the bottom here you'll see Us Electronica, a role model for the collaboration between art and ICT. That's, that's a, another big strength of what Ars Electronica does. Um, I could talk about this quite a lot. I'm just going to give one very quick example. Uh, a, a very close colleague and a good friend of mine, Hideaki Agawa, has kind of re-established, I think, the, the, the framing of, of uh, this kind of um, 
art industry collaboration and the importance of that in, in Japan. We have collaborations with many big Japanese clients. I think the last time I spoke to him, we now have one project or another happening with eight of the 10 major sponsors for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And he does it in a way where he's not trying to disguise art at all, he's putting it out there directly as part of the program. So this was the one program that, that ran for three years. Hakuhodo uh, is, is, by the way, one of the largest design companies in the world. So this was a design company working with Ars Electronica specifically on the topic of art as a, as a catalyst for the future or art in innovation. And we basically act there as a kind of a satellite lab, as a remote lab, as an incubator to work with Hakuhodo and these industry clients to come up with mostly important questions about the future. This is, this is not all of what we do, this is just one project that I wanted to mention. Um, but uh, that could cover a whole range of, 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 of fields and a whole range of different topics. For instance, we, I remember this great project we had with Toyota, which was about the future of mobility, and they were seriously interested in what four-year-olds, four-year-old kids might be might be thinking about the cars they're gonna drive in 20 years. So we created this, this game with little toy cars in an interactive environment. So kids were, were driving around, but this, 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 this is the kind of um, mentality of the way of thinking which doesn't fit into a model that a traditional design agency might be used to, to working with, where we had to create something like a playground and then from that we created a, a kind of some, some interesting questions that then led into some research that the, that the industry client might be, might be willing to explore further. Uh, this project, and um, again, here's Nahum in the background, is um, a project which is very, very dear to me that I've been working with for the last few years. It's called the Future Innovator Summit. And this is a project where we receive quite a significant amount of industry funding to curate conversations about the future from an inter to transdisciplinary perspective. So we basically use the budget to have a week-long event to invite people from all different cultures, different backgrounds, different skill sets to come together and to have conversations about the future. And, they, and, and we, we do that under umbrella topics such as what's the future of humanity or the future of education um, the future of work and again the interesting thing here is there's nothing about uh, some kind of solution driven approach to this these are these are industry clients that are investing in questions questions about the future and I think that this is a really kind of important aspect to what also Ars Electronica is doing in the in the realm of where art and, and industry can come together um, Again, back to, the, back to the education topic and what I will try to um, summarize into most of the activities that I see as most crucial in terms of what's happening on a practical level. This is mostly what I do in Australia and I do this with, with universities that um, are investing, I think, a lot of money in a lot of the wrong places to try to get to the same, to the same outcome but it's working and it's growing. So I think that that's, a, that's an important um, a reflection on, on, on that culture. These are some of the, the institutes we've worked with recently. This is this year, this is the Queensland University of Technology. So I was there for, for six months. And essentially what we do is we disrupt the general context of what's happening in with the curriculum and we use experimental art or experimental art projects to create a, uh, a completely new way of, of, under, for, of generating kind of knowledge through the, through the experience. So again, here you can see my model and how we map it to, a, to what would be a, a normal curriculum running over, over two semesters. And we go through processes of concept scope, scoping, question finding. We start with, skip one slide forward. Discipline de decontamination, that's an important one. That's, I work with a lot of dancers to get people out of their usual modes of thinking. We start off with people from a whole variety of different backgrounds. We have 50 people in a room from 
you know, mathematicians to, to dancers to musicians, but nobody knows where each other are coming from. They don't even know each other's name in the first point. We, we pull them into the room and together we actually do this with them. We're part of the educational experience is we try to release ourselves from the normal way of, of practice. And then we go about coming up with some new questions that relate to some of the same topics that, that I was just mentioning. And we go through a process and along the way we have various kind of milestones. But all the while I'm using a lot of um, metaphors for my research. I, I'm also very interested in Eastern philosophy and I use metaphors, things like, you know, from, um, I think from the, from the Tao Te Ching, things like, if, if you don't change direction, you end up where you're going. You know, that's a classic thing. If you're, if you're in the design process or you're still in the art process and I try to keep reminding the, the participants to come back to this. And the participants, by the way, are not just students. They're, they're also teachers. They're, they're even professors that are interested to explore these, these new topics. Again, we try to create influences for, for coming up with new questions. So here's some, some examples. Uh, how to grow the empathy. And then the students work on those and they come up with ex example experiments. And from that they start to do more concept scoping, new questions, and they start to explore further. This is the festival this year. So this is the culmination. The students are coming. There was three projects at the festival this year. There's the whole team up the top there. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just focus on one. This is a, a fantastic project in my opinion. That's Jacob, he's a third year dance student. Um, his question, he really was fascinated from the beginning was how do we become more human? Which is again a, a question that came from the Future Innovators Summit. So Jacob teamed up with some engineers, a roboticist and an extremely well-educated um, filmmaker who hurt his back and got into robotics to build this very advanced cinematic robot device. And Jacob, as a dancer, is communicating with this AI to try to explain what it means to be a human being. So there's an audience watching this. And through it, he's addressing some of the most fundamental and important topics that are happening in the, in the development of AI to do with you know, ethics. Um, in particular, how quickly things are moving beyond the scope of what we are able to keep up with and what is the difference fundamentally between the object of the robot and the human being in the context of the body. I think this I project, think this project will, will continue to do, to do, to do very, well. very well and, and uh, it's, just, uh, another it's just another example. example. I mean, these guys are dancers, the roboticists and, and uh, filmmakers, they've never worked, they'd never worked in, this, in, this in this context together. Now they're looking to tour this work internationally. internationally. Just a quick statement on why it's important and why are the universities investing in it and I think these are these are two things that many of the people in the room might already know about. That's a, a, the blurred image in the background, it's the, the classic model for this knowledge acceleration, you know the idea that over the last hundred years we've gone from knowledge doubling at almost the rate of a century to post second world war something like 13 years I think currently it's something like 11 days and so on and so forth. So it's moving very fast and industries in particular that the universities want to engage more and more with are not interested in the outcomes of some of the R&D in, in, in the innovation spaces in the way that it's currently happening. So there needs to be new models and new ways to be able to, to bring out some of these results. The second is this idea of the, the, the classic career factory model. I think this is a very positive thing, but of course there's negative implications. But the idea that you go to the university to get a job and most of the programs are designed in that way, that's changing quite a lot. They know because of the impacts of things like AI that you know, 60, 70 percent of those jobs won't exist. So we have to be more agile. They want, they want to educate students to be able to cross different fields, to think more broadly. I think you'll see a huge emergence in, in um, areas like philosophy. In the, in the future coming back where they've, they've now currently been uh, thrown out of a lot of the, the traditional university curricula. And this is, again, what it's kind of about. This is what the universities are trying to, to achieve. Again, this elusive term, the transdisciplinarity. Um, another quick reference, Joey Itu, director of the, the MIT Media Lab. I've just been reading his 
his recent book. Uh, he talks a lot about a lot about this in the context of of issues that we face in the future and how we need to find different ways to to adapt, to be agile, to throw away the kind of traditional models of of, uh, of methodology. He goes beyond even transdisciplinary and, and quite overtly describes MIT Media Lab as anti-disciplinary. I think it's maybe something more in this space. That's what I'm doing in my own, my own PhD. So this is still in process. It's not published. I think the universities are achieving something more in this, this kind of section here. I think they're starting to understand how the disciplines can connect in different ways. But I think the the main thing that they're trying to achieve may never happen within the context of the way that universities are, are currently structured. More often, I think, and it's already happening, they're, they're investing in completely separate spaces outside the, outside the traditional format that, have, that don't have to answer to the, to the bigger engine. I lifted this from a slide someone posted on Facebook the other day. Um, from another presentation from, from this guy Jackson and I wrote him and, and just asked if I could use it. He was using it in a totally different context but again what's important here is all that money goes into research and it's only touching a very small percentage of the actual people at the end of the day. This is an art project. This is an art project where we're communicating the topics to do with future mobility using miniature robots but we're addressing some of the most fundamental and the biggest topics that are um, that are currently being debated also within the industry and the other commercial sectors. That's just an average audience from the city of Brisbane. So I'll just close with a couple of things. Firstly, this is, this is something that Horst mentioned during the festival as a way to think about what we need for, for the future in education. It needs to open up. We need to think about those different platforms for how we can engage and cross over from these intersections with science and, and education. In doing so, to think about enabling communities to also empower themselves to create and come up with their own solutions. This is pretty close to, to you guys here, another plastic island that's just popped up. They're popping up all over the place. So I don't really want to get in or present debates about global warming or the effects, but this is something we can't deny. This is, this is a result of the human being. We create this. So this is like a serious topic and how can we, how can we address those kind of those things. I'll just quickly show two very quick examples. So I've got three minutes apparently, so I should be on time. So examples of art-driven transdisciplinary planet, research outside the context of the university. Removing them is very time-consuming and dangerous. Millions of landmines leather the landscapes of the world turn countries around the world. My name is Masuda Sani and I want to change this. Our mission is to solve the landmine problems within 10 years. In 2012, we have launched our first Kickstarter campaign. It is called the Minecafon. A low-cost wind-powered anti-landmine detonator. It rolls along on a desert. When it hits a landmine, it blows itself up and it destroys the landmine at the same time. After three years of hard work, we brought our mission to the next level. Now we are very excited to introduce you our newest robotic invention, the Minecafon drone. It is an airborne demining system which aims to reduce landmines in less than 10 years globally. Minecafon drone flies above a dangerous area. It uh, generates a 3D uh, map. Then it detects landmines with a metal detector and GPS coordinates. The drone has a robotic arm which places detonators on top of a landmine and blows them up from a safe distance. The vision of this project is uh, to inspire a lot of women in uh, Indonesia. They can they, they, they can do this process in their, in their own kitchen so they don't have to go out from their home. With the soya culture, I think it's the best way for me to uh, explore uh, the design and the textile at home. There's a lot of 
tofu and tempe fab factory in Indonesia. We took the tofu waste and then we strain it. After that, we wait until about three days until the pH is around three or four. After three or four days, we... I'll just jump through because I need to wrap it up. An incredible bunch of, of women creatives, artists from Indonesia taking soy waste and using very simple techniques that anybody could do in their kitchen to convert that waste into everything from you know, clothes to shoes to other types of products that can, that can be used. So that's where I would finish. I think we, we need to think about new types of languages. I think the transdisciplinary language is, is something that's very interesting and very important. And we need to think about how we can inspire the, the communities we live in this kind of space at the moment. It's changing in, in ways that we can and cannot imagine, but we know the connectivity is, is there. We need to find ways to be able to connect and intersect and shift together. So thank you very much. Sorry that I don't speak Spanish. I hope it wasn't too fast. Bueno. Muchísimas gracias. Con esto cerramos Epicentro. Tenemos, if we have some questions, si tenemos algunas preguntas para Cristefan, él estará de su lado izquierdo con todo este proyecto tan interesante. Pues cerramos Epicentro con esto. Gracias a la Secretaría de Innovación, gracias a Ciudad Creativa Digital por este día de tanto aprendizaje. Vimos cómo las industrias creativas estaban a través de todo el momento, de todo el tiempo, de en todos los aspectos de... De, del mundo que nos rodea y vimos cómo el arte, la ciencia, la tecnología está también ahí presente y no podemos dejar de lado que vivimos en este, en este mundo de, de arte y de ciencia y que tenemos que seguir investigando y tenemos que seguir innovando para que este mundo tenga una implicación social e impacte de manera importante. Muchísimas gracias a Cristefan, Arce Electrónica, a la Universidad de Australia Y bueno, les entregamos este reconocimiento de parte de Epicentro y de Ciudad Creativa Digital. Un oh, wonderful. Thank you. Espacio. It's kind of Austrian. You need to put some Lederhosen on there and yeah. Great. Muchísimas gracias a todos por venir. Es un placer tenerlos aquí. Gente tan de todas las edades, hermosa que que viene a aprender, que viene a compartir que va a cambiar el mundo, que va a cambiar México, que está cambiando Guadalajara. Gracias por compartirnos, son el motor de todo que esto que pase. Para ustedes se hace el, el, el festival, para ustedes queremos compartir y es un placer tenerlos a todos aquí. La siguiente actividad también está interesantísima, son dos actividades, una un concierto increíble de aterciopelados y muchas bandas más en Chapultepec. Y lo que sigue también es un paseo hermosísimo de Día de Muertos. Los que quieran disfrazarse o costumizarse están allá pintando. Los que quieran solo pasear, vamos a tener un día hermoso de Día de Muertos con tradiciones, con vendimia, compartir ciencia, arte, tecnología y sobre todo mucha tradición y cultura de México. Gracias a todos por venir. Los esperamos el año que entra. Si tienen alguna pregunta con Cristefan, él estará por acá contestando.